I'm still here, I'm still still alive, and I'm still always going to be alive. Um, I'm always going to be here until the day that I'm not. Um, you realize that life goes on um, in the midst of that uncertainty. And to me, that was just kind of like, that was really a, a really big like spiritual breakthrough, was that embracing those uncertainties is, is not a bad thing. Well, hello, hello, my faithful subverts. Thanks a lot for tuning in today. For those of you that are new, this is a human interest podcast centered around interviewing musicians. However, uh, just a little teaser, soon I'm going to have a guest who is not a musician, but I will just leave it at that, just saying that there's a pretty big guest coming who I'm really looking forward to releasing and seeing how that goes. But our guest today is also very important to me. Uh, His name is Phil Jamison. He is guitarist, frontman, founder of a band called Caspian, who I've been a huge fan of for a really long time. So I reached out to him on Twitter, got him to get back to me, and we set up an interview. It was actually pretty painless and, and really cool of him to come on. But I sat back when I was done recording this one, and I just sort of thought, like, wow, this is exactly what I was envisioning when I started this project. Just two people with this common shared interest and love for music with the background and context specifically into the insights of each genre. You know, so I, I really do hope to work with more people who are deeply entrenched into the, you know, groups of bands that I really liked growing up and, and who I still listen to today. Anyway, I just wanted to let you guys know that I'm really proud of this episode, and I hope that you enjoy it. If you do, and you're new here, please hit subscribe on your way out on your podcatcher of choice, and feel free to give me a share. I'd really appreciate that, too. Uh, My name's Phil, and I am a principal songwriter, guitarist, sort of multi-instrumentalist, primarily a guitarist in Caspian right now, and we've been going for the last 14 years. Which saying that saying that out loud is pretty wild. It's a long time. Um, I am also in a I'm, I'm also a bass player in a project called Dream Tigers with a few of my friends from Defeater. Um, we're going to be cutting a record next month. And other than that, I just kind of dibble and dabble in my own sort of strange creations that I just keep locked away on a hard drive. And other than that, yeah, just sort of listen and react but other than that that's the main stuff awesome so uh sort of let's start at square one sort of tell us a little bit about you growing up where you're from and sort of what it was like growing up let's see i grew up in boxford massachusetts boxford is a pretty rural town the north shore of massachusetts about 45 minutes north of boston and it's like i said pretty rural in the middle of nowhere um maybe four or 5,000 people in the town. Lots of woods, um, lots of ponds, kind of just a really quiet, pastoral, mellow place to grow up in. Um, so I went to high school there, and afterwards I went to a college in Wenham called Gordon College. I went there for four years, and I studied philosophy and history and learned how to drink beer. And um, That's probably really the most important into, thing. About college. Exactly, yeah, yeah <laughs> top of the list, and learned how to, you know, play music with people. That's when I started really getting into uh, being in a band. I wasn't in a band prior to college. Um, I started playing the guitar when I was around 15 or 16. I played the drums for a few years before that, and um, it wasn't until college when I had sort of a wider social circle to dip in and out of that I was able to sort of establish myself in more of a collective format, and before that, Um, I guess I grew up a bit isolationist, so I had a lot of time to myself, and like I said, there were a lot of woods around there to roam around in, and I just sort of did my own thing and tried to sort of generate my own love for music, um, I guess on my own terms, outside of any kind of, I I was never really involved in like a scene or a, a movement or anything like that in my youth. It wasn't, like I said, until college that where I met other like-minded people that we all just started messing around in dorm rooms and basements and people's living rooms and stuff like that. Um, so I did that for a few years, graduated college and I was in a band called Holly Sawyer Rifle Company. Holly Sawyer Rifle Company was, uh, 
sort of like a, I don't know, indie alternative band. You know, we liked everything from Pearl Jam to Sunny Day Real Estate to Pedro the Lion, that kind of thing. And had a lot of, had a lot of diverse influences, um, a little more traditionally structured stuff. So it was like verse, chorus, verse, definitely heavier and started to get a little bit, bit more experimental uh, towards the twilight of that band. When that band split up, um, I met a fellow named Cal who also went to Gordon, who was just a wide-eyed youngin who had really, you know, great taste in music and was an excellent player. And we got together and started jamming, and then we started Caspian. So that was, yeah, way back in 2003, 2004, around then. Um, he introduced me to Joe and Chris, who would become our uh, drummer and bass player, and then we just sort of set sail, I guess, man, and we been, haven't looked back since. Right on. So uh, did you kind of come from a uh, musical family? Were you sort of pushed into music uh, from a familial uh, aspect? My my mother grew up playing the violin, um, so she certainly had an ear for music, and then her mother and my grandma was a piano instructor and a church organist and, you know, perfect pitch, the whole thing. I was never really pushed into it. Uh, I discovered music, you know, purely on my own terms. My parents both appreciated music and you know there's always lots of music playing in the house and stuff and it was definitely celebrated but it wasn't necessarily you know venerated as like this this highest of highs art forms i guess um it was there and it was enjoyed and it was appreciated i grew up in a i grew up in a christian how like evangelical christian sort of environment um so a lot of the music that I was being inundated with when I was little was, you know, stuff with like a religious narrative to it, whether it was like DC Talk or Petra or the Newsboys or Amy Grant or shit like that. Um, that sort of, I guess, in some ways set the template for for me in terms of music that was really overtly spiritual. Um and that I, I don't want to say that was forced on me because my parents weren't forceful people. They didn't like sit, they didn't they weren't the kind of parents that would like throw out secular albums and stuff like that. Um, oh yeah, totally. Uh, but that that's definitely sort of I guess like the musical ecosphere that I was weaned in. Um, I discovered Led Zeppelin when I was fourteen, I think, and that that really much that 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 really like just changed the course of my entire life. Um, yeah, when I discovered Jimmy Page, I think it was a VHS recording of their song Remains the Same, uh, kind of cheeseball documentary that they did in 1976. And uh, I remember watching that thing just over and over and wearing it out and just, like, you know, shredding it to pieces, more or less. And I remember just watching Jimmy Page in that VHS tape over and over and just being like, that's exactly what I want to do. Like, there it is. Um yeah, and it's tough when, you know, not not tough, maybe that's not the right way to put it. I'm sure there's a, a better way to, to say it, but, like, when you're raised in that kind of sort of evangelical environment, you're always being pushed towards, like, whatever your calling is, you know, quote-unquote. Um, and, you know, everything that everyone does at that age when you're growing up and you're finding out what you're interested in and what your passions are and where your talents lie, you always... Are try, people try to steer that towards some kind of like discipleship or a ministry or like <laughs> a calling or something, you know? And so when I came across Zeppelin, um, that definitely like took a, a sharp, like, like a detour, I guess, in that because um, he wasn't all that popular, like amongst Christian circles. You know? Sure. Yeah. Even though so, the, yeah. the music in Led Zeppelin isn't really overtly, you know, uh, sort of against the grain as far as Western values or anything. Um, right. But but obviously they were known as, you know, sort of a counterculture movement, I'm sure. So Yeah, and they had all like the, there were rumors of like masked satanic messages and stuff in their music. And, you know, at our youth group, you remember that, right? Like, do you, you remember this movie, uh, Hell's Bells? Does this ring a bell? Um, well, I don't know. Anyone who's listening who, you know, grew up going to church and stuff might know what that is, but... Hell's Bells was this like three part epic documentary about how rock and roll is basically like, you know, Satan's work. And it's a vessel that Satan uses to attract, um, you know, emotionally unstable 
uh, like just open people uh, into the fold of like Satanism and how he uses like popular music to do that. And there were all these anecdotes from everyone from, you know, the Beatles to, you know, more obvious stuff like uh, some metal that was going on to Zeppelin. And I was always the dude that was like trying to defend Jimmy Page to my last dying breath and like trying to debunk all this stuff in this, in this, uh, in this documentary and it ultimately got like pretty uh, exhausting, you know? So that, that was me. I was that guy. I had, I had friends that were evangelicals as well. And I, I told this story on the podcast, but I think it's worth telling again that I, one day uh, there used to be this CD shop because even when I was a kid, you know, people still actually bought hard media and, mm -hmm. and I, I went to the CD shop and I ran into one of my best friends at the time. And I, you know, I went up to him. I was like, oh, hey, what's going on? And he was bringing in all of his CDs. I was like, oh, what What are you doing, man? And and he was uh, he was going to sell his CDs because this place uh, took used ones. And yeah. uh, and he was one of my evangelical friends. So so I do. I, I don't know if he got pressured or if it was more just like this sort of, um, you know, this this natural uh, logical next step or for him in his yeah, faith. He, he was praying about it for like hours and hours and fasted and then came to the conclusion that like he should not have those records, not, should not be in possession of those. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, some of them weren't even that like crazy. I, I think I remember seeing a Roots, uh, album and <laughs> I don't know, just some, some that really weren't even that crazy, but yeah, but I, I mean, that, that culture is so good at twisting things that are even just marginally secular and making them appear um, like, you know, deeply anti-religious. Like, they'll read into every line, even if it's supposed to be poetic or metaphorical, um, because it's such a, it, in terms of the way it operates as a belief system, I mean, it's so immutable, and it's not open to change or progress. It's not open, really, to a lot of forms of creativity, um, and so much art is expressed creatively with nuance, and it's just not, it, it's not really conducive to a lot of that. So stuff that you and I would look at now and see as borderline, um, or not challenging or um, not, you know, aggressively anti-Christian in any way. You could definitely, if you wanted to, like you could reframe it that way. And there, you know, a, a lot of that worldview is, is really good at successfully doing that, especially when you're impressionable, you know? Sure. So and uh, one, one thing while we're on this subject, uh, so, so the college you went, went to was, uh, what was the name again? called Gordon College. Gordon College. And it, so I did listen to your interview with uh, with Pete Holmes, and you guys went to school together there, right? And, yeah, correct. And, right. and, and that was a really uh, uh, fundamentalist school, if I remember from your guys' stories, right? I mean, the, um, very theocratic, you know, like, right? Yeah. Uh, there, there are certainly Christian colleges out there that are, are, are way more strict and way more, you know, just binary in terms of good and evil and right and wrong. Um, I mean, I guess to the outside world, and you know, if you go to like UMass Amherst or Penn State or something, yeah, it's like um, really strict. Okay, but it, but like there's such a sliding scale in, in terms of that. Like there are universities out there like like Bob Jones or um, what's the one in Florida? I, I can't remember, but you know, where boys and girls have to like walk on different sides of the road and shit like that. Um, yeah, so I mean, it wasn't even remotely close to that, but yeah, it was all under the uh, umbrella of a Christian worldview, and it was, you know, they tried to be scripturally based, and they had a code of living that was trying to adhere to, you know, biblical truths. Um, so, yeah, when I was considered, like, I didn't even really want to go to college, um, at that stage in my life, like senior year of high school, like I said, I was kind of not ostracized. I, I was, I, so it was like self-inflicted. Like I just pulled myself away from everything. I didn't have much of a desire to be social. And then college came around. It was like, well, I guess I should do this. And I didn't really put a whole lot of thought into it. I knew that there was a school close by that a lot of my friends had gone to. And like I said, I grew up in church and it just seemed like a natural step. And, you know, my parents, it wasn't, I wasn't forced at gunpoint to go to a Christian school or anything like that. Um, it was just an easy decision that I didn't have to think much about. And I figured I'd do it and get it done and then just do the next thing. Um, but yeah, there, there wasn't, there wasn't anything about that experience that I would, that I found like traumatic. Um, and that's, yeah, I, I don't know. 
And there wasn't anything about it that inflicted like eternal, infinite, lifelong damage because I was already coming from such a secluded religious um, template, I guess, that, yeah. But it, yeah, sure, I mean, like I said, for most people's, especially from a secular perspective, there were a lot of like weird things, you know? Couldn't be alone in a room with a girl and, yeah, I mean, you heard all that stuff, but. Right, right. And, and I mean, I'm from a, a Lutheran background, so I mean, to some extent, there was there was quite a bit of social conservatism in my upbringing in some ways. Although, mm-hmm. um, uh, folks that know much about me know uh, I I didn't come from the best household, the most traditional household. My my parents were never married and stuff like that. But but I mean, there was still that air of like this expectation of of what a good person should be, and it wasn't necessarily how you treated people. It was uh, how you look to the community in some way. Um, but gotcha. from, but from what you guys were talking about and, and I don't really want to get bo- too bogged down in, uh, and bringing out things you've already talked about. Uh, but, but it, it, it seemed like more of a sense of community. It wasn't like, it wasn't like this pressured thing that, you know, was, was really forced upon you. So at, at least it sounds like you guys got something out of it. Uh, by by going there and it was a fulfilling experience. I mean, you started yeah, Caspian yeah. there uh, for sure. Yeah, for exactly. All. I mean, and like I said, I can only I can only speak for myself. I mean, I think it sort of treated treated different people in different ways. Um, but like I said at the top, uh, I learned how to be in bands and play music with people there. And to me, that's like the, the single most valuable experience of my life so far. I guess. Um, yeah. So it wasn't all a wash. So uh, I'm kind of curious what uh, got you into post rock because that was something that uh, probably at the time wasn't all that popular. I mean, I only discovered this genre of music maybe I don't know, uh, perhaps five years ago or so, and I fell in love with it when I when I listened Wild. when I first yeah. saw 28 Days Later and Godspeed You Black Emperor was yeah. like they're usually the they're usually the uh, entry point is Godspeed and it was the it was the same way for me. Um, I'm, I've always been the kind of guy when it comes to bands that has more, uh, depth and breadth, I guess I would say. Like, I don't, I, I, I couldn't rifle out like the name of a million different punk bands or whatever, but like the bands that I was into, I was obsessively into. So like I said, there was Led Zeppelin, they were the first and I just wanted to know every little tiny thing I could about that band. Um, And then it moved into stuff like Pearl Jam and Oasis and some British music like The Verve and things like that. And once again, like I know there was a a scene around that stuff, but I I would just usually have a couple bands that I would just get obsessively, obsessively enmeshed in, I guess. Um, And yeah, around 2000, yeah, well, I know exactly when it was. It was February 2002. Um. I, I think a friend of mine had played me a Godspeed record two or th- two or three years prior, but it just I wasn't ready to connect with it yet because I was like I said so immersed in my obsession. I think at that time I was pretty obsessed with Radiohead. Um, but I went into my local record shop and I did a total blind buy. I just I walked in, I walked 13 paces down the second row, stuck out my arm, picked up a CD, went to the counter, paid eight bucks for it. Got in my car, uh, drove around, listened to it full blast. Like I was going to listen to whatever I had bought. I just sort of committed myself to that. I would do that sometimes. Um, and it happened to be uh, Godspeed, You Black Emperor's Yankee UXO. So I heard that, and it just, I mean, it blew me out of my chair. Um, I mean, I had never heard anything even remotely like that before, and it just connected on like this really cellular level inside of me that I had never yeah, I mean, it, it just, it, it blew my head off. Um, and yeah, that, that started that. So I just started immediately going down that rabbit hole. Uh, I showed it to the guys in my band at the time and they liked it, but they weren't necessarily knocked out. Um, and then, you know, when I met Cal, you know, I brought that record up and he was like, oh yeah, if you like that, check out this. And that's when, you know, explosions had just done the earth is on a cold dead place. And Sigo Ross had just released Parenthesis, and then I just sort of really, I started exploring the whole world of Constellation Records and all those Montreal bands like Exhaust and Fly Pan Am and Silver Mount Zion, um, 
And that was the first, I guess, come to think of it, yeah, that was the first, like, scene, quote-unquote, that I ever really just got obsessed with, where um, I started tracking down as many bands and as many records as I could, and I just started amassing this stuff, like, arsenal of post-rock CDs and post-rock records and the whole thing. Uh, so, yeah, that, that all started for me in 2002. Um, and, yeah, like... You know, I always forget that in the grand scheme, in the bigger picture, it's still a really young genre. Um, but, man, for me, that was 15 years ago. You know what I'm saying? So, like, I've definitely, I've had my ups and downs. It's just, it's been a, it's been a long relationship. Yeah, I mean, so. uh, a big part of your, your career is obviously uh, rooted exactly, in that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. go ahead. Oh no, I, I was I was gonna say yeah exactly. And when it comes to Caspian, it's like we were in, in the right place at the right time. And I really attribute a lot of any success we've had uh, to, to basically our positioning. Because you know when when we were doing this in 2004, when I was discovering this in 2002, I mean yeah there was Godspeed and they were huge. Uh, they were doing big shows and they were established. And Mogwai was on the radar, but there really weren't there really weren't a lot of other bands doing this. Um, and uh, I started to catch fire. You know, there were people like me out there and then there was a Caspian for them. And now, you know, man, I wouldn't even want to, I would be hard pressed to start a post rock band in 2017, just because it seems like, you know, everyone's, everyone's getting into this style of music and starting bands. And I mean, it's wonderful. Um, but it's definitely, you know, overly saturated for sure now. So, yeah, and it's sort of a niche market. I mean, uh, there's yeah. there obviously there are uh, plenty of plenty of fans of of that kind of music, but but it's it's still sort of on the fringes. And and I don't know what it is. I think it's it's more people's lack of attention span, uh, mm -hmm. maybe that that it has a bigger part to play in it. Uh, because I even remember when when I had put on I put on mono for someone. When when I was uh, living in in my hometown and and they were like they just got bored of it after like six six or so minutes they're like well where where are the vocals when are those going to come in you know uh -huh. so yeah. so so I just I feel like maybe some some folks just are going to going to get turned off because there's no uh, poetry but to me though um, I I really see a value in that because uh, when I when I listen to uh, instrumental music it's not sometimes i put it on when i'm just reading and i need to really concentrate because uh i have add so it's it's really it's it, it, music really gets me in in a trance um to, mm -hmm. to pay attention to something if i'm really sort of letting my my attention drift uh, yeah. so so I, I mean that's that's a go-to kind of genre for me is either uh post rock or or jazz or something that that really it's creates an atmosphere you know yeah yeah it helps yeah. me concentrate so and i guess i'm kind of curious uh did you guys you guys were always going for the instrumental thing right not necessarily i mean when we started it was certainly like i said we were positioned in a place where a lot of the music we were listening to back then was instrumental post-rock um so we were as musicians trying to be, you know, first and foremost, original and impulsive and just react to our, our senses and our experiences. Um, at the same time, that's what was percolating and that's what was sort of rattling around in the, in the, in the atmosphere back then. So it, it was there and it was, it was influential, but, you know, we also, I mean, that, that comprised maybe 10% tops of the, the swath of music that we listened to. We were listening to everything and 90 percent of it was vocal based and uh we didn't enter it dogmatically saying look we want to be instrumental uh we actually wanted it, it's really funny because you know aaron as you know one of our guitarists uh he and i have been friends you know for 17 years and long before caspian started we were buddies um and he's a great singer he didn't join caspian until 2007 uh, but yeah, back in 2004, when we were jamming, like he was going to be our vocalist, he was going to be our singer. Um, and we actually wrote material with him singing over it. And it sounded kind of cool, but it just it wasn't really quite jelly. And then he had another project and whatever. So we were 
we were aiming to have a singer at our first show and we just hadn't found anyone yet. So we played the show instrumental and we sort of at the last minute, you know, massaged a few parts here and there to make the songs flow a little bit better without a singer, knowing that we weren't going to have one in time. Uh, and after the show, people were just like, y'all don't need a singer, man. Just keep doing this. And we were like, you know what? Yeah, that, that felt pretty good. I think we will just keep doing it this way. And yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think, I think, uh, uh, for that style of music to incorporate vocals, you do really have to be uh, uh, pretty unique about it. Uh, one one that I can think of off the top of my head, uh, there's there's a couple actually, uh, Marriages, uh, which has yeah, it's uh, with uh, Emma and Greg, yeah. Yep, yep. From from Red Sparrows, I'm a I'm a huge fan of Red Sparrows and Marriages both. Um, They're great, man. Yeah, we got to tour with them in with Red Sparrows in 2010, and like just amazing group of people, and awesome band yeah fantastic like one of the best dude yeah and i saw them on tour with bosnian rainbows omar rodriguez lopez's oh yeah uh, project yeah and and yeah. i was blown away and i didn't realize until after i was like man this sounds like like so familiar and then i went and looked at looked it up later and uh and yeah one one of the people from red sparrows is in there i was like ah i (laughs) i see it now i mean obviously a totally different thing but you know a musician certainly brings over a certain uh you know certain vibe with them i'm sure yeah without a doubt like greg is i mean he has a signature way of playing bass that just sounds like him doesn't sound like anyone else and um yeah it was so cool to hear that carried over into marriages you know in a tasteful way where it was, you know, nothing structurally, nothing at all like Red Sparrows, but I, I like it just as much, maybe if not more. So, yeah. And then Emma has just got this beautiful voice. I mean, mm-hmm. just, just floored me. Um, You've heard her solo stuff, right? Yeah. Yep. I'm a yeah, big fan. Fantastic, man. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, so before we geek out too much on your, your colleagues yeah. here. <laughs> so, and I've said this before on the show, that I see, uh, and, and I know that you you actually call the kind of music that you make. Uh, I heard you say it on Pete's podcast. Um, you don't call it post rock. You like uh, uh, because it sounds a little pretentious. Uh, what did yeah, you call it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, modern classical, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's dude. It's always shifting, and it's funny how many people who play this kind of music really bristle at calling it post rock. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't know why that is. Uh, I guess I'm one of them. Um, and I still can't come up with a good answer. Like I don't, there's just something about, maybe it's just like possessiveness or something. I, I have no clue. Um, it's, it's just tough. Like, cause over the years, you know, post rock, when, when I was starting to listen to this stuff and when it was still much smaller, I don't want to sound like old man river here, you know, like, or just, uh, like Gandalf being like, Oh, you know, um, but I mean, it wasn't necessarily, I mean, it wasn't necessarily instrumental. It wasn't necessarily like twinkly guitars with delay and reverb. It was just a different way of articulating song structure. And it was a different way of using instruments to co- communicate emotions, um, or sentiments, whatever. And like, over the years, it's sort of just amalgamated into this thing where it's like if you if you don't have a singer, if you you know you have a clean tone guitar doing something twinkly, and then all of a sudden it gets really heavy and crescendoy, then that that's post rock. And to me, it's like it's just such bullshit. Um, it never was that to me ever, and to a lot of people, I guess like it, it, it's tough. So like. Like I, that that's like a dog that I don't want to like chase down because I, I could I could get way carried away with that.
Yeah, now in like modern classical, that's all. I mean, come on, if we're going to talk pretentious, right? Like that's the <laughs> sing, that's the single most pretentious thing. You that's could a good ever point. Say. So like, um, hey, I'm just a casual listener. You guys are the yeah, ones making the music. No, no, so, I, and like I said, I failed over and over at like finding a good way to express it. I just, um, I, I I don't know. People ask me what kind of band I'm in now. I just say you know an instrumental rock band, and it's uh. It, the the mellow stuff is mellow and the heavy stuff is you know really heavy and it oscillates between the two really quickly and um, some of the songs are really long and it's just it's it's atmospheric you know yeah it's ignorable it's accessible whatever so and I always describe it to people um, if they're not music nerds I'll just tell them it's it's instrumental rock and you know um, yeah perfect yeah um, so. So, and I, I've always described it, um, I, th I feel like there's definitely roots to progressive rock in there because there's like the symphonic element and it's almost like you're telling a story through the instrumentation, which uh, for some folks yeah, might be a little, a little bit difficult to, to, uh, you know, to understand what I mean by that. Uh -huh. Um, mm -hmm. but, but, uh, music, it's like, I think bringing in the term classical definitely is apt for it because you are sort of bringing back this sort of storytelling with music. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, 100%. And when I sit down to write a song, that's all I'm thinking about. So I can understand how that might be foreign to some people. It might be a little hard to unpack at first glance, just talking about it that way. But to me, that's always come, like, that's always been my approach to songwriting. Um, it's like, in my head, a certain instrument represents a certain care. I mean, this is also going to sound pretentious. So I don't. I guess I don't care. Um, like you know, a certain instrument represents like a certain character, and you watch. If you follow that instrument, if you follow that melody, if you follow the way that that instrument is expressing itself and unravels, or recoils, or what shape or form it takes, and how it sort of descends and ascends through all these little you know arcs, up and down arcs. Like to me, that's every instrument in a song and one of our songs represents something like that. And that's how I'm thinking about it when I'm trying to structure songs or write parts. Um, that's not to say that it starts with a story. Um, it doesn't start like, all right, I'm going to write a song that tells, you know, like the, the story of the hero and his confrontation with chaos or something. It's, it's not like that. Um, like a small little seed will start like a seminal moment. And then the, you know, if you have an imagination, um, that will just sort of then like it'll it'll pick up there and just like then the then you're just like off to the races if you just let yourself go to that process of like absorbing whatever narrative the song is communicating and trying to follow it and I don't know I I feel like I have a duty to doing that um, yeah and that's that's a hundred percent how I think about it like every single time when I now when I listen to uh, that's the great thing about listening to other people's music is that um, maybe they had something specific that they were some kind of story they wanted to tell in mind, but they're not going to tell me what it is. So I have to sort of formulate my own. And I like folding my creative process in, into that act of just listening to it. Um, but I mean, I can, it's obviously harder to do that with pop music and it's harder to do that with, you know, a country where there's such a specific lyrical narrative, um, but yeah, I mean, songwriting to me has always been about storytelling, and I, I, whether it's a country song or whether it's a post-rock song, to me, it's uh, you know you're telling some kind of story, and I, I like the way just about every genre of music does that. Um, and I think what I was attracted to with this kind of music was the subjectivity of it and how just natural it felt for me to express different stories that way. If that makes sense. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, and and you know when I listen to certain post-rock bands that use like more of a minor key uh mm -hmm. I, i'm always i'm always sort of putting myself and maybe this is just me projecting because the first time i heard this kind of music was in 28 days later but there's like this apocalyptic tone to it you know oh, where it's absolutely where it's yeah. epic and and you feel like the world is ending and it's and That's, you just revel were, in it <laughs> when i was listening when i was getting into godspeed and like i said entry point band um that's all i could think about like i just had constant apocalyptic visions that were just really dark um, and, uh, so dark actually that I wrote that band, <laughs> a letter, um, back in 2002, like that's when I had a typewriter and I would just, you know, furiously chain smoke and sit behind my typewriter and just 
you know, write ab absurd, stupid things that I would, would balk at reading right now. But like, one of them was a letter to that band because I was like, I was taking over my mind, and I'm so, I'm an incredibly emotional person, and I was getting carried away, and I was like, look, I've never heard this kind of music, I've never heard your music, but it's conjuring these really dark visions, um, you know, apocalyptic, and like I don't really know what to do here. Maybe this is common, like because I had no touch point, like I didn't know, like maybe this is how everyone reacts to this kind of music. Um, and like I, I saved that letter, and I, I I haven't read it in forever. It'd be hilarious to read that sometime. Um, but they actually responded to me, which was really really cool of them to do. Um, and they were like, "Yep, like it's all good. Everything's gonna be fine." Um, <laughs> like they kind of brought me off the ledge a little bit, but it was a nice little moment of vulnerability at the outset of this whole thing. And uh, yeah, but no, a hundred percent, dude. Those are the kind of those are the kind of thoughts with them especially the minor key stuff yeah well when it's major key stuff then what do you think of like the antithesis is it is it heaven or um euphoria yeah certainly euphoric like um uh like l1011 and mogwai i usually sort of more bubbly uh ex okay. experience of music i don't actually think of anything specific um i i was thinking like caspian's music is because you guys incorporate the electronic stuff I think yeah. of it, and you guys are more in the minor key. Uh, generally, it's it's uh, it's more like a dystopian sort of uh, hmm. feel to it. Um, as as far as like if if I'm thinking about it, setting a scene for a movie or something like that, which I think there is a cinemat uh, cinematic element to to this kind of music as well. Um, Big where time. where yeah, um, and and I feel like I, I really wish that more m more independent or uh, or sort of smaller. Uh, filmmakers would incorporate this type of music. Maybe they are, maybe they are, and I'm not coming across that those movies. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I remember when uh, I ordered the uh, the vinyl for F sharp, A sharp, Infinite, and and they they sent they sent all this stuff with it, like like they Is had a smashed coin in there. Yeah, there was a smashed coin yeah. and like flyers from a show and stuff. And yeah. I don't know, it just. I just have, I, I certainly have this emotional attachment to, to that band and especially that album. And, and I don't know, there's just something, something really cool about pulling that album out and getting that, that stuff out. And I don't know, I don't really know what I'm saying, trying well, to say there, it, but. Well, that's a, it's, Godspeed is one of those bands that continue the tradition of, you know, the ritualistic, like. I mean, people do these unboxing things now, I guess, you know, with an LP or whatever. And it's like, look at these, like the flashy color of this vinyl. Like this looks like cat vomit on like, you know what I mean? And it's like some people get off on that. And that's really cool. Um, but yeah, back in the day, there were like little trinkets and little things and like different die cutting. And uh, it, it was just such an ornate. I mean, of course, this is long before like this technological revolution with streaming and file sharing and whatever really exploded. Um, so the artifact had more importance. Um, but yeah, I remember, I remember doing the same thing with that record and just being like, wow, if because like you, physically and just tact, you know, it's this really it's this tactile object. You can hold it in your hands. There's all these other all this thought went into it, and you assume that the same amount of thought went into the creation of the music that's on the record. So they work in tandem, and it's like it's this really exciting, um, like I don't know, witnessing some kind of like some some labor, you know? Yeah, and and you know, you always get uh, like a poster or something in 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 a record, and that's fine. Um, that's better than just the the record itself. But I think there yeah. was something particularly genuine about the the flyers from shows, uh, you know, twelve years ago, and and the coin and everything, and and I mean it it wasn't like gimmicky like the Cheech and Chong huge rolling paper, you know, like like it was <laughs> it was something that felt like it meant something, you know, yeah. and, and and like it was a piece of uh, a piece of the the band themselves uh, exactly. rather than a gimmick, um, and and you know i said that we weren't gonna uh i was trying to get away from geeking out but i don't think that i can help it <laughs> in some ways um Follow the so, impulses, man. um <laughs> so i do want to just talk about uh your guys's albums a little bit here um so so just to kind of briefly go through it uh y you said you guys have been making music uh for for what you said 15 years um 
and and your first two albums uh, were were kind of more. Um, I, I sense I I definitely can tell your guys's uh, metal influences where where yeah you kind yeah. of do those those uh, sort of crescendos uh, where you you know the song sort of dies and then it gets into just an upbeat kind of metal. Uh, you know, more high energy stuff. And, and yeah, I can definitely hear the, the elements of metal coming through in those first two. And, and then it seemed like there was a departure from that in waking season where it was more, you guys incorporated more of the electronic elements and, yeah. and started using a lot more samples and synth and stuff like that. And, it, and that one was sort of more tranquil and, and sort of uh, evoked uh, an experience of solitude and reflection. So is there any particular reason why Waking Season was so much different than your last two albums? Um, or was it more just yeah, what you I were mean, feeling no, at the time? It, it, well, I mean, it's always, it's always a combination of, of both. Sure. Uh, I think, you know, Tertia, the, the record before Waking Season, um, you know, I very rarely go back and listen to our records just because when they're done, you just kind of turn the page and whatever. <laughs> yeah, kind of um, like a stand-up comic, also, you retire it. <laughs> you know, exactly. A band like us, I mean, we've been we've been just road dogs here for like 12 years, just constantly touring. Um, and when you play as many shows as we've played, and you play those you, you play those songs over and over and over and over again, um, you just become completely consumed by you know, whatever 10 songs you put out on a record for, you have to spend two and a half years on the road living with them and performing them. You get an idea of what you did well and what you didn't do well. And then when you go to do a new record, you sort of take all of that and stir it around in a pot. And, um, you know, Tertia was an especially heavy record for us. Um, I think tonally, if you listen to it, you know, there's just a lot of low mid range. There's a lot of really aggressive, um, I mean, I think it's, yeah, I, it's certainly the closest we've ever got to quote unquote metal. Um, but you know, Tertia to me is always going to be like the, it's, it's, it's the sound of just like pure for our band. Um, it's just pure unbridled ambition. You know, it's like, we want to take over the world here. Like we want to be, uh, the biggest post-rock band ever. Um, you know, we're going to make our bid with this here. And it, you know, that, um, that ambition translated translated itself into something obviously that was certainly very heavy for us. And when it came time to do the next record, you know, we toured Tertia for two and a half years, and we got to see, that was the first time we really got to stretch our necks a little and see. You know, we went over to Europe a bunch of times. We got to go to Asia, and you know, we did some wild shows in a lot of wild places we never expected to go to. And then when the dust settled from that experience and we had to like you know sort of dust ourselves off and figure out what we were going to do next i think you know tranquil is a good word i think we wanted to sort of just like restabilize ourselves um and not like not chase that dragon too hard uh it's a little bit of like like i said there's this duty i always feel like as an artist i have this duty to sort of keep keep things fresh and like keep pushing us forward and not repeating ideas. Um, I don't, I can, I can't really successfully come up with a reason why I feel that way, but I've just always felt like it, it, you're sort of, you're being counterfeit if you just do the same thing over and over again. Um, so there's that duty and that's more, that that's motivated completely by like the intellect. Okay. Like that's just pure brain power. That's just like, no, like you, you have a duty and an obligation to push it forward. And then there's sort of the more latent emotional feelings and sentiments that you have going on underneath the hood, which are just more like you know, where you, how you're actually feeling. Um, what is like just circling around in your life at the time. And yeah, all of those things came together for waking season to be what it was, I guess. Um, it was a calm after the storm. Like I said, we toured a while and we started writing that record in the summer of 2012 and things had mellowed out. So we were feeling a little bit more just open and we could like breathe for the first time in a while. And that combined with that sort of intellectual duty to, you know, ex incorporate more instruments in order to stumble across more, more sounds and try to broaden the palette. Um, I think that was a, creatively, that was a, a really good moment for us, you know. Um, 
And then we got to work with Matt, with Matt Bayless on that. And that was the first time that we got to work with like a, you know, a reputable, reputable producer who had done, you know, big name records. And he definitely brought, brought like his own flavor to the, to the proceedings. Um, and yeah, yeah, that was, that, that was a good little moment in time for us creatively, I think.
most recent record, uh, Dustin Disquiet was, you know, you, you guys definitely picked up the energy uh, in, in that one. Um, yeah. And, and was more sort of a, a revisit to the, to the, at least the, uh, the emotion and the, the energy yes. of your first two albums, Four Trees and Tertia. Um, right. And yeah, yeah, I mean, I definitely saw more of those metal elements come out. And, uh, and yeah, I really, uh, I'm a big fan. Uh, so we really, yeah, we weren't expecting to do that with that record. I think we all went into that. Um, you know, we wanted to, we wanted to pay tribute to Chris, uh, our bass player who passed away. Um, yeah, in between, so he passed away in 2013. So, um, when that happened, you know, we didn't really stop to catch our breath. Uh, we had a bass player that was, we were going to be touring with. And Namiani, who's now you know full time, he's he's in the band, uh, and we just sort of kept moving and um, you know started working on that record. And I think we all entered it wanted wanting to do something a little bit quieter and a little bit more plaintive. But you know those those uh, feelings of of anger and confusion and sadness really manifested themselves in some, in some heavier shit. So that's where we found that record going. And we just, we definitely followed that thread, um, right up till the end with that. So yeah, it was a, that was, that was a very, uh, a really demanding creative process for that record. That was not easy. It took us a long time to write. We had a lot of ups and downs interpersonally. Um, you know, it was definitely born of, born of a lot of fire, but I, I, you can hear that in the music hopefully. So for sure. And, uh, and I guess the sort of, uh, uh, what you're talking about here leads well into the last question here. Do you remember a particular moment in, in your childhood or, um, or young adulthood when you sort of realized your mortality or perhaps for a Christian, uh, or someone who grew up in a Christian household, maybe it was more a test of faith that, um, that, that made you sort of question the finality of your mortal life? Hmm. Oh, that's a very, that's a very good question. Um, yeah. And I usually put people on the spot with it. I thought about emailing you ahead of time, but <laughs> if you can't think of anything specific, a situation that made me question my mortality or, um, or like, uh, where you realized it maybe that, um, this life is fleeting. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Oh man, that's that's a good question. Uh, <laughs> I knew I should have. I knew I should have. Well, I remember when my, I remember when my <laughs> grandfather passed away. Uh, he, was, he was a really good man. Uh, my father's father. Um, it's always it's always when it it strikes on a, you know, a really I think personal familial level. Um, and that that was a moment where I, I think when you see death impact someone that you're close with, not necessarily even yourself. But, you know, like um, my father and I are very close. Um, and when I, I think when I saw the, the way that impacted him, that was sort of like the, that was the, uh, yeah, that was the moment where it all sort of crystallized and made sense. And it was like, oh, this, this, this has an effect on people that I love and care about. Um, and which, you know, it generates a sense of empathy, of course, but, um, yeah, that that was the first time. I think that was in the early '90s when it. Yeah, that became it became very real. Um, not even that. It, you know, I, I was I was young, um, and I was. I, I love my grandfather. He was a great guy. But the impact that I saw that have on my father was, I think, especially powerful. Um, and that's when it kind of just like when it rang home. And now I look back in hindsight, and yeah, that re- kind of reinforces the you know, collectivism of the human experience, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. That yeah, makes sense. The, the reason I bring it up, uh, on this show so much is I feel like, uh, musicians are particularly empathetic and usually have some, some kind of, uh, deeper reflection on, on mortality. And I think it's something that we need to confront more because maybe in our culture, we sort of push it into the background and, and it's the third rail. It's like the third rail that you can't talk about, you know, um, oh, I, I mean, I, I, it should absolutely be spoken about more. I mean, especially, you know, when our bass player passed away, that, that was massive. I mean, that was, I mean, soul destroying on every kind of level you could ever imagine for all of us. And, uh, yeah, it, 
there is definitely that. Yeah, I guess calling it the third rail. I guess so. Well, no, yeah, no one, no one wants to confront it. I mean, everyone here is. We're trying to do things that keep us alive for as long as possible, and like trying to eat the right foods, and like, you know, it, it, all, all of it just goes in the face of flies in the face of of mortality. So I agree, it's something that should be discussed a lot more. I don't know if like musicians. Uh, that's interesting that you isolate that empathetic quality in musicians and view it as maybe a reflection of. Um, you know, a conduit to receiving something about some enlightenment about mortality. Um, as a musician, I, I, I feel it's a hundred percent my duty to express that through song. So, and especially when you're doing it through instrumental music and there aren't any lyrics to moor you or anchor you along the way. Um, hopefully that incites a little bit more reflection on the part of the listener. Um, you know, like there are certain songs we have specifically written about that and we wouldn't go out and, you know, title them like mortality or yeah, like right. thoughts on death part one. You know, <laughs> uh, right. but, you know, a song, a song like dust and disquiet, that's our like thesis treatise statement on, on mortality and death. Um, him for the greatest generation is the same thing. Now it's a little bit more upbeat. Um, but you know, that song was written as a tribute to, People from our grandparents' era, obviously the greatest generation, and that we wrote that around a time when, you know, that generation was just very slowly, um, just dwindling and you know disappearing completely from the face of the earth. And uh, so we, you know, write a song about it. Um, a lot of the songs in the last record were really informed by that. So. As a musician, I mean, it should be pretty obvious that, like, it's, verbally, it's pretty difficult for me to articulate. But I, I feel pretty confident that our our songs do that. Um, and yeah, I, that that's the goal right there, you know. For sure. Uh, so it's all, it's all on the records. <laughs> yeah, just listen. Uh, yeah, between the notes and find the words, right? <laughs> exactly, my brother. Um, so, and I don't want to keep you too much longer, but just, just to wrap up this conversation on mortality, sort of where do you sit now with, uh, you know, your, your background in, in, uh, you know, Christianity. Uh, so where do you sit now on, on what do you think about it? Um, I mean, that's a, that's a loaded one, but like, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the diplomatic way of putting it, I guess, is that, you know, the jury's, the jury is still out and it'll, it'll always be out, um. I, I certainly, um, I mean, if I look back at myself, even as like a seven year old or an eight year old, and if I could sort of watch myself from afar and, um, observe my thoughts and my behaviors and whatever, it's like, it's never, it never really like made sense to me. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's an abstract concept that you're not going to be it, here someday. It is. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, death. Death and mortality, I, I kind of I didn't brush it aside or turn a blind eye to it, but it just sort of I don't know. But in terms of God and theism, I guess like it just never really checked out. Like I was always kind of like a budding like material rationalist or something. You know, it was like, well, this doesn't really make sense, and there are all these different cultures, and there are all these different. Like I just viewed it like really, really rationally, I guess. Um, and obviously, the longer you're alive and the more life experience you accumulate and the different things you go through, you start sort of re-articulating and re-phrasing a lot of those questions in different ways. And I know it's a, to me, I mean, it, it's a cliche, obviously, but I mean, I really do view the whole thing as a journey. And um, there was certainly a, a time in my life where I wanted the answers, like, you, you know, simple things, like you want to know what happens to people, you know, when they die, where do they go? Where do we come from? Like the simple, big, like meta questions. And I felt like I needed to have an answer to those. Like I was basically like couldn't move or couldn't function without knowing like what the answer to the, you know, what happens when you die? Well, I'm not sure. Well, that's not good enough. Like I got to know because I can't really move forward here or formulate a game plan or conceive of a way to live unless I know where I'm going after this ends. And then when I slowly just let go of that and it's like, well, I'm still here. I'm still, still alive and I'm still always going to be like, um, I'm always going to be here until the day that I'm not. Uh, 
you realize that life goes on um, in the midst of that uncertainty. And to me, that was just kind of like, that was really a, a really big like spiritual breakthrough was that embracing those uncertainties is, is not a bad thing. Um, and if anything, I, I would hope that it's kept me more open to other people's, you know, the variations of other people's experiences and trying to be sympathetic to those and not trying to just be on like the war path to convince people that a certain thing is true and something else is wrong. Like I'm, I just stay out of political discussions, religious, anything that can be like even remotely polarized. And it's not cause I'm scared or afraid, uh, or I don't have opinions. Um, I just think like we're, we're not here. We're not around long enough to engage in that kind of thing with any kind of antipathy or, or, um, ill will or anger. Um, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, but, it, it does that. And you put it much better than I could. Um, <laughs> All right, man. Well, uh, you've been very generous with generous with your time, and I appreciate you coming on and uh, and chatting with me here. Um, yeah, right. I appreciate the questions, man. Yeah, and uh, are you uh, you and Caspian going on tour or your uh, your other projects that you got? No, on? yeah, we're Caspian's on on legit pause right now. So um, yeah, we're just we're taking a breather. Uh, our guitarist Aaron is hiking the Appalachian Trail with his wife, which is pretty pretty incredible. Um, they're making good time, but yeah, they're going to be out till October and we're just all kind of, kind of, you know, recollecting ourselves and, um, take, taking it easy this summer, but we'll, we'll be back out there in, in due time for sure, man. Otherwise I'm just going to the beach and hanging out. So yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, I will be paying attention and, uh, and yeah, I will, uh, direct listeners to where they can find your guys' music and everything. And, uh, and yeah, hope to talk Great. to you soon. Hey, thanks so much, Trey. Have, yep. a, uh, have a great weekend, brother. Yep, you too. Hey, thanks for listening all the way until the very end here. If you liked this week's show, please hit subscribe on your way out on your podcatcher of choice. Feel free to give the show a share on Facebook at facebook.com slash subversionwebcast, or you can share directly from the show's website at subversionwebcast.com. Again, thanks for tuning in, and I will hopefully see you next time. Thank you.